Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. So I, I called the uh, legislature together and I said, uh, you got to do something here. We're broke. We went out and got the business. We went after them. It's a strong state because of its wealth, because of the ideas of the people. And if we can find better jobs for the young people, they have a great future. Stan Hathaway. From a childhood homesteading in a tent in Goshen County, Wyoming, he grew up to become the 19th governor of the state. On his watch, Wyoming imposed its first mineral severance tax, an act that has provided a trust fund for the future and a wealth of services to the state citizens. He reshaped Wyoming government and the lives of the people who live here. Three things that shaped Stan uh, were his uh, early years on the prairie in the sod uh, house, literally. His World War II Army Air Corps experiences in the B-17s. And the third thing was uh, his marriage and love of Bobby Hathaway. Stan Knapp Hathaway was born in 1924 in Osceola, Nebraska, one of six children of Robert and Lily Knapp. His mother died when he was two, and his father, unable to raise six children, sent Stan to live with Velma, an older first cousin of Stan's, who was married to Earl Hathaway. So Velma and Earl didn't have any children of their own, and they lived in South Dakota. They were so thrilled to get this darling little baby boy. It was the time of the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, and the Hathaways, who adopted Stan, moved west from South Dakota to Wyoming, clinging to the dream of wresting a living from their own small plot of land. The great uh, winds that started in Kansas and Nebraska went into Wyoming. It blew clear down to hard pan, and there was, uh, there was nothing. And I, I, I shall never forget my, uh, my mother. She couldn't keep dirt out of the house. But the great thing in my mind about the Great Depression is how people helped each other. And I knew that I could walk to any of the neighbors and they would have me for dinner. And uh, it was just a wonderful feeling. He was separated from his siblings and raised in pretty harsh circumstances. And his old school principal, uh, would say in later years, Stan would milk 15 cows twice a day, once in the morning and once at night. After I got into high school, we had to wait till the uh, uh, sugar industry was over for the year. They all, all, the, all the kids at the school had to work. I think Stan was quite happy. Uh, we were all happy. We didn't know that we were poor. The ordeals of that generation are hard to imagine today. After the Dust Bowl and the economic collapse came World War II. Eager to enlist, Earl Hathaway, who had served in the First World War, announced that he was signing up. So they milked the cows that night, and Earl was kind of pensive, Stan said, and, and then he said, you know, I think I'll go in tomorrow and enlist. He had already served in, uh, in uh, World War I. Stan said, well, I'll go too. So uh, they got up in the morning and went in because they were doing it over at the uh, courthouse. There was a line of uh, six or seven blocks of old people, young people, middle-aged people, women, mostly men, but some women. They wanted to sign up for the, to get into the war. And uh, it's always in my memory because that's what they thought of our country, you know. My dad and I finally got up to where the table like this, 
and uh, they wouldn't take him because he was too old. And they wouldn't take me because I was only 16. They went down to the Bronco bar, drank a couple of beers, went home. And when they had left, Velma said, well, what are you going to do with me? There's 12 cows to milk twice a day. And you can't do that to me. And she was really pretty upset. Mom was so tickled and to see us, and she, she cooked a big dinner. But Hathaway persisted. And soon, while still in his teens, he was a radio man and gunner flying in a B-17 over Europe. He flew dozens of combat missions and was shot down twice. To Leipzig, I thought we were all going to die. We lost 56 B-17s and 24s that day. From my radio room position, I saw uh, the planes on both sides of us go down. And the plane above us nearly hit us going down. I don't know how we, I don't know how we survived. One of the missions, they had dropped their bomb load and uh, a bomb got hung up in the bomb bay. Uh, they're at 20,000 feet. Uh, they're flying back to England. They can't land with bomb bay doors open and the bomb lodged. Uh, Stan got down on a little catwalk and uh, with a stick was able to dislodge the bomb. It fell harmlessly into the English Channel and they were able to land. I got to the point that I thought I was, I was on, flew on 63 missions and uh, some of us on the plane got the idea that we weren't going to be around much longer. And uh, I, uh, I prayed and I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I had courage then, I didn't, didn't nothing bothered me. And the crash landings themselves, the, 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 the fire involved with the crash landings, those were things that haunted Stan for his entire life, but also shaped him. When Stan was discharged, he intended to go to the University of Wyoming and study law. But he was reunited with his brother, Milt, also a veteran. And one night over several bottles of stout, they made the decision to attend the University of Nebraska together. Lucky for Stan, that's where he met Bobby. Um, she is, originates from Sioux City, Iowa. And, and her grandmother was there and she was really close to her. And then she went to the University of Nebraska to school, which is where she met Dad. The story is that um, Mom was engaged to another man. <laughs> I don't know if we should say that. that. <laughs> Mom was, Mom was uh, actually engaged to a man, and he introduced them. Bobby, uh, exceedingly brilliant woman. And uh, she was with Stan all the time. And uh, she uh, enabled Stan to go to law school by teaching. She was uh, accepted to medical school and she gave that up to help dad through law school and he really wanted to return to his home, home area and I don't think there was ever any question that they would do that. I think she was in love. We've all heard about love. <laughs> they moved to Goshen County. She taught out in Tiny Huntley while he set up a law office in Torrington. The first year in a law practice, I, I didn't make any money at all. I had one client. He came in one morning. I said to him, what the hell are you doing here in the daytime? Well, this is not a, a time to be off. He says, that's no way to treat a client. <laughs> that's the only client I had for two years. He paid me $40. So we're still about starving, you know. But if Bobby hadn't been working, we would have starved. Stan and I have laughed on occasion what his life would have been had uh, Bobby been the medical doctor. Stan would have been a man of leisure, hunting and fishing, two things he loved the most. And the state of Wyoming would have lost a great uh, leader. The law practice took hold, and Bobby and Stan began building a life. Small town Wyoming was a great place to raise a family. It was a wonderful little town, and um, we had no cares when we were little. Um, we lived in a neighborhood where all the kids were our age, and we went in and out the back doors and in and out of the refrigerators. Our backyard was a, a focus in the summer. We had people there all the time. And the parents would get together in, for yard parties all summer. Um, 
we were very close to the people there, and um, even the dogs seemed to run in, in herds around the neighborhood. In a way, those backyard parties were the beginning of a political base for the Hathaways. Stan Hathaway ran for county attorney and won. Well, it started at a more grassroots level because they were precinct committee man and committee woman, and I remember mom spending all the hours on the phone reminding people to vote and going and getting gathering people up and taking them to the polls. That was when the travel started, and they went to all the conventions. In 1964, he became a Republican state chairman, and that was the Goldwater uh, period. Goldwater lost, as you know. And I said, I'm through with politics. I didn't like that. Well, that's, my friends came down on them state sermon. You gotta, you gotta run for governor. I said, don't have to run for anything. But in January 1966, Senator Millward Simpson, Stan's political hero, confided that illness would force him not to run again. And when that news became public, Governor Cliff Hansen decided he would run for the Senate. Next thing I knew, I was running. And one of the most enjoyable things in my life, my wife's life, was going across this state and meeting these wonderful people who, uh, you know, just made you feel good. He wasn't the candidate of the ag and mineral interests, what he called the third house. It wasn't like he had a strong base of support from within traditional Republican Party interests from which to launch this effort. When he decided to run against the darling of the Republican Party at the time, Joe Burke, who was just a tremendous guy and a well-qualified man, Stan, instead of being the insider, he was he, the, the good old boy. He was the outside guy looking in. Stan won the Republican primary. Now it was on to the general election and a race against a well-known articulate Democrat, Ernest Wilkerson, who demanded a debate. They thought that Wilkerson was so articulate that he would just cut Hathaway to ribbons. But Hathaway said he you know, felt like he was running from him and he, he didn't want to do that, so he marched up to his office and said, you bet, I'm going to debate. But the condition was that they would hold the answers to three minutes, which would kind of help even the odds because Wilkerson was famous for not being able to get to the point in any short period of time. In 1966, one of the biggest issues in the gubernatorial race was whether to impose a tax on mineral extraction. Today, it's considered Stan Hathaway's greatest legacy. Except in that first race, he was against it. There was talk of a severance tax at the Wyoming Constitutional Convention. I mean, it has been talked and talked and talked about for years. And it wasn't until Ernest Wilkerson ran for governor in 1966 against Stan Hathaway that the issue really came front and center. Stan Hathaway was elected in 1966 to be the 19th governor of Wyoming. The happy years in Torrington ended suddenly when the family was picked up and driven to the state capitol. We all cried all the way to Cheyenne, all four of us. And we hadn't really, there was the campaign and mom and dad must have been doing some preparation, but we didn't, we didn't talk about it until we got up and went. I don't think anybody understood the changes that it would mean. Biggest thing Stan had managed was a two-man law office. And uh, that was the beauty of the man. He brought to the table no governmental experience. And in some ways, that made him a much better person because he had no preconceived ideas or notions on how things should run. When he left Torrington, uh, he had a, a net worth of about a million dollars and uh, came into Wyoming for governor for eight years. And the highest salary he ever had was 25000 And it was less than that uh, for most of the time. One reason the governor's salary was so low was that the state purse was empty. So the candidate who had opposed mineral severance taxes became a governor who championed the tax. So I, I called the uh, legislature together and I said, uh, you got to do something here. We're broke. You know, the general fund got down to, to $80. 
once becoming governor, seeing revenue needs for the state, seeing that there was going to be a lot of development and a minimal severance tax wasn't going to impede that, probably changed his mind. But even so, he didn't have an easy, easy road of it. The Republicans were deadly opposed to uh, any tax on minerals. They'd been fighting it for 40 years. So I, I went to the Democrats and got a few of them stirred up. Along with ranchers, the mineral industry had a powerful voice in the Wyoming legislature. A contingent led by the director of the Wyoming Mining Association came into Governor Hathaway's office to tell him what was what. He said, we don't like what we're seeing, Governor. We don't like your appointments. We don't like uh, the things you've done with the uh, mineral industry. And we want you to know that if you, you run again, you have no future. You, 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 you will not be elected. And it, it infuriated me at the time when I stood up and batted the I said, don't you bastards ever come in here one at a time or as a group and threaten me with, with my future in uh, politics, because I don't give a damn. I am here to serve the people that elected me, and I'm going to do the best I can. But Hathaway was no enemy of industry. In fact, he began a campaign to recruit out-of-state banks and corporations to finance development, mine the coal, and grow the economy. We went out and got the business. You can't sit here and wait and hope that uh, they'll come around. We went after them. We took that old airplane, went all over this country. And so he asked if he could borrow my brother Roy and take him down to Cheyenne as the, just for a couple of years, he said, as, as the Director of Economic Planning and Development. Roy would arrange to go to New York, to go to Chicago, to go to California, and sit down with potential people who might have shown some flicker of interest in Wyoming. The pitch was simple. Wyoming is a nicer place, a less crowded place, a better place to raise a family and grow a business. And for the energy industry, there was a wealth of raw materials unsurpassed anywhere on the continent. Instead of working with a hundred feet of overburden to get to a two or three foot thick seam of coal, come out to Wyoming and he'd show them hundred foot thick seams of coal with only a few feet of overburden. And that was the start of the development of the huge coal industry in the Powder River Basin. As I look back on it, it was my biggest contribution to this state that I caught more hell over than anything else. It was just a matter of issue after issue facing the state. Tremendous industry uh, proliferation, the coal mining, the over-timbering that was going on. Wyoming was not prepared, and we needed to be. I thought as governor he ought to take the leadership on it. Well, uh, he didn't really. It's proven by today, you know, we got more minerals than any state in the Union, and if, if we were a country, we would rate in the top four or five. But we were sitting on those minerals, not doing anything with them. With the revenue generated by the severance tax, Hathaway did a lot of other things to grow and reshape state government. And Stan, uh, when he was in the governor's office with two or three of his personnel, sat down and drafted uh, the uh, law that created the Wyoming Environmental Quality Act. I'm Governor Hathaway. We want to help you plan your future in Wyoming. During those eight years, you know, several major departments were created in Wyoming government, economic development and planning, the Legislative Service Office, uh, Central Purchasing, uh, the Wyoming Industrial Development Corporation, Department of Health and Social Services, and so there was a lot of expansion, growth in state government. Stan Hathaway may not have gone into office knowing all the things he wanted to do. He adapted to situations, learned from others, and when he faced opposition, he dealt with it. He would uh, see what was going on around him and, and pick up ideas of what effective programs were in other states and what, what uh, way the state may 
might hopefully respond to the needs of the people. Stan was the kind of manager that he would go into the cafeteria in the basement of the Capitol building and, and have coffee with people and sit down and actually listen to what was going on with the secretaries or the mid-management people. He's been known, you know, for dressing people down when they take unreasonable positions. So he's, he's gruff, kind, and firm all at the same time. Almost no one describes Stan's years as governor without mentioning Bobby Hathaway. She was a supporter, a partner, an advisor, and a force on her own. Mom worked a full day, and so this was a whole new thing. It was um, beyond the role of giving teas and acting as a hostess. Mom was truly busy with real, very real issues. The Arts Council and uh, the Department of Health and then Social Services. Well, she had a lot of things she wanted to get done. And by God, she got them done. In 1970, Hathaway easily won a second term as governor. The state was growing wealthy off the energy industry, and many who had once opposed mineral severance taxes now wanted to raise the tax. They decided they liked the severance tax, and they wanted to double the, or the rate on it. I said, I told the mineral industry that we won't ask for money unless we got to have it. But a lot of the coal in Wyoming belonged to the federal government. And without a federal leasing program, that coal was imprisoned underground. After two terms as governor, Hathaway was expecting to take a federal judgeship. Then he got a call from Washington, D.C. in 1975. And one evening, uh, Jerry Ford called Stan at his home and said, Stan, I, I need your help. He said, I'd like you to give up the judgeship. I'd like you to come back uh, to Washington, D.C. He said, we're having problems at the Department of the Interior. We need to put a federal coal leasing program in place. We need to start developing our nation's coal reserves. We're subject to the whims and uh, the challenges from OPEC and other countries, and we don't have the energy independence we need, and, and coal can fill that void. Gerald Ford was an appointed president. Nelson Rockefeller was an appointed vice president. The Democrats controlled the United States Senate. And now Stan Hathaway is coming in trying to run interior uh, under those conditions late, late in, in the term. And, uh, you know, it was an eye opener for all the boys from Wyoming. Stan Hathaway just didn't really measure up the way I thought a person should. As the, as the fellow who made the decisions on all of these uh, very uh, valuable natural resources. As the vice president said here, the other, he's, he came to see us a while back. He said, you never had a chance, Dan. You never had a chance. As the environmentalists, we're not going to let me have a chance. Hathaway was approved by the U.S. Senate despite a grueling grilling during confirmation hearings. That ordeal was followed by a painful initiation into the Washington bureaucracy. First cabinet meeting he went to, this fellow turned to Stan and says, now, uh, I want you to know that uh, we have our own ideas of what should be accomplished. And uh, he almost said in these words that we don't need any advice from you, Secretary Hathaway. Stan literally worked on the federal coal leasing issue, reviewing the environmental impact statement, the documents and supporting information and data. He worked on it for two to three weeks, day and night, literally day and night. So uh, he went in uh, to uh, see uh, President Ford, and he, he told President Ford that he uh, didn't think he was being successful, he was having so much opposition with what he had done, that he thought it would be in the best interest of the President if he resigned. And uh, President Ford uh, said, uh, no, he said, I support you, I'm with you. Came around from behind his desk, uh, hugged him, and he said, uh, let's just check things out. So the White House physician came in, 
and uh, met with Stan, examined him there in the White House, and uh, gave him a full and complete uh, physical exam, and told him, he said, I think you're, you're suffering from burnout, or from overworking, and that you have a, a case of depression. They were devastated. I think they were um, extremely disappointed. They, they feared that they let everyone down. And, um, you know, people really, they really hadn't. Um, but it was a hard thing to talk about. Hathaway's White House breakdown led to his resignation from Interior, and it began a series of hospitalizations for him and for Bobby. Months went by, and then he called Brent Kuntz and asked him to come to Wyoming and start a new law firm. We had a mutual friend uh, that said, Stan's a dead man, uh, he'll, he'll never make it back. And he said, if you go with him, you fell too. Uh, you know, he, he just lost it all. When he came back home, uh, he had a net worth of about $30,000. Most of it was in funds that they'd created for their two daughters for, for college. He was broke. He was flat on his back. He literally had to start his whole career again and, and establish their whole life. And I think it was a huge accomplishment to get past that. Stan Hathaway and his law partners built an enormously successful practice with many energy industry clients. He kept a certain distance from the political world, but the politicians did not forget him. I know that he talked with all the governors that were elected after him and they had an understanding that they could come talk to him one-on-one -on -one anytime they want off the record about anything. When you ask Wyoming folks what they view as the legacy of Stan Hathaway, the answer is no surprise. There's no question about it. The, the, the Hathaway legacy is the Wyoming Permanent Mineral Trust Fund. He was the only leader, given those circumstances, that could have gotten the original severance tax that is so vital to the development of the state of Wyoming. But to his credit, he really pushed on the severance tax thing. And I thought it was one of the best things he ever did even though I knew that uh, others had proposed it first. It took a lot of courage and guts to face the legislature. But when you ask the people closest to him what they remember about Stan Hathaway, you get another sort of answer. We were raised to always think that we need to give back. We, we really understood the stresses they were under. We could see it every day. and. Um, I think because of that, we didn't share a lot with our parents about how miserable <laughs> sometimes we were. They had a full plate. They had two full plates. He became the commander of the duck blind, and he would tell everyone when they could blow the duck whistle or the goose call. Same with fly fishing. He wouldn't yell, Powder River, let her buck, but he'd give out a hoop and a holler that would let everyone on the stream know that Stan had caught a fish, whether it was the biggest one or not.